Oh, we gotta love you too. Hello. Oh, bitchy, 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 bitchy. Travis. I'm feeling very gentile here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Apple, Google, and Microsoft, they all announced plans to end the password as we now know it. That's dumb. Really? I don't I don't like it. I, I like having passwords and I don't want to talk about that anyway. But that means I can't use well one, two, three, four, five, six as my password anymore. I I still don't or, want to talk Travis, about it. Or Travis nine eight seven. I step why don't you ask me what I do want to talk about? Okay. Travis, yes. what do you think Bo wants to talk about today? I think he wants to talk about how his uh, password was still... No, no, <laughs> no. You don't. Sorry. Guys, I want to talk about... The... No, I've been spending the last three days, and you know this. I can't believe neither of you are like, duh, we want to talk about All your right, scammer. Let's start, let's start but... with, I hear rumors that <laughs> you... you have been jousting <laughs> you... with a scammer. <laughs> you don't get a do-over. All right, fine. You get no, the do-over. No, it's not a do-over. I think it's just qualified as a snark. Snark? Listen. Yeah, not I, do over. Yeah. I, I'm i going to tell you, Adam. Is that anything like quark snark? No, quark is a German dairy product. I. That's dark. Well, or a nanoparticle. But I... We're doing this on a lark. Guys, <laughs> I almost knocked it out of the park. I almost knocked it out of the park. And ask me how? How, okay. well? Well, because you're like a shark. Well, <laughs> it was a shark. All right, no more rhyming. I see, I'm serious. All right, okay. so I think Bo, we're barking up the wrong tree. Oh my god, <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you my story anymore. Oh come on, you met a guy in the park. No, I met him on Instagram, and he offered me and five thousand. <laughs> I hate you guys. Hate. I actually hate you guys. I've known you too long, and you're taking <laughs> advantage of my niceness. All right. That I, was a reach. <laughs> that was terrible. But that was all terrible, and I still don't like you. But so here's okay. The deal. So back to passwords. No. Instagram. <laughs> Instagram On Instagram, scammer. a man is trying to scam you. He, we, a person, a human, a human by the last name of Davis, according to the his his whatchamacallit thomas davis hi thomas um thomas davis thomas he won 390 million dollars in a lottery 390 million 90 million dollars yeah and so he got in touch with me yes because he wanted to spread his money around to people who needed it this dude offered me five thousand dollars and I was super excited, and I wrote back to him. And I think I told you, Adam. I, I sent you what I wrote back to him. I don't oh, remember no, I what I wrote, though. I saw the back though. and forth. It's actually very inspiring from the standpoint of non-scammers. I wrote, yes! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes! Exclamation point. And he said, well, do you have a cash app, PayPal, Zelle, or Venmo to receive payment? Are you following my Instagram account? Because that was the deal. You had to follow his Instagram account. That was it. Mm. You got five grand. So I said, I'm following. I have Venmo. Is there a tax issue? I worry about scams where money is sent and then canceled and in between overpayment is made and requested and then I'm out the money. I co-host a show about scams, so I'm super cautious. Hey, you want to be on the show? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's bring Tom on. So I wrote back to him, amazing. And he said, you don't need to be scared, he says to me. I'm real and legitimate and you are with the right man. I'm going to need you to send me your Venmo username so I can send the money and also your valid email address. I said, okay, I just tried to get into my Venmo account and it seems to be locked because I didn't want to give him my real Venmo. I said, my best friend is a tech guy. That's Travis. And he's dropping his kids off at school right now. He said he'd help me when he's free. Shouldn't be long. I can't believe my rotten luck. And then I sent him a lot of emojis that ex ex expressed my rotten luck. Travis... What were you going to do at this point? I was going to set up a uh, burner phone number, a separate Venmo account, separate email address, just to make sure that we had a bit of a buffer between uh, ourselves and this guy. So, Adam, he has like the um, the Jeopardy uh, waiting tune. Dun, 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 dun. So he's like sitting there waiting for me. And, and I go, he says, OK, right? He's like, cool. Here's the here's the kicker. He goes. Um, so you'll have to pay $30 to my personal assistant account <laughs> <laughs> registration fee. So I wrote back and this is where it got funny. I go, are you kidding me? 
I got to wait for my friend. Wait, totally. Wait, he asked me to ask you, if you have $390 million, why do you need me to send 30 bucks? Said so sound a little fishy. I'm dying to hear his response. Well, he also, I also said, would you be on our show about scammers? I promise not to turn you in, which we could do. <laughs> since, <laughs> since we have work with a retired Secret Service agent and a white hat hacker with close <laughs> ties to the letter agencies, eh, I just want to interview an authentic small time swindler. Is it possible? We can disguise your voice and you can tell us funny stories about people who fall for this nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Was he offended when you referred to him as a small-time no. swindler? No, it was so funny. I wrote back, well, and then I ended, I said, we'll give you $250. He writes back, lol, lol. Well, hey, that's more than 30. Yeah, I said, so he said, I'm using this opportunity to support the community in this, in this hard times. Now he starts to show that he's in a boiler room. Did, you, did, did he send you his 501c3 papers? Yes, he, no, he didn't. Yeah. So this this hard times. So we have like that's red flag numero uno, right? And then besides the whole thing, and he goes, I really want to help more people with my winnings. The thirty dollars is for registration. Ah, you know, I wrote back a thousand dollars. He wrote back, Are you ready to pay for the registration fee and receive your money? Two question marks. I wrote back, come on, we already know the scam. We'd like to interview you. It's more than you make with a bunch of $30 idiots. Come on. LOL, he writes back. Easy money, I write back. I'll tell you what, I'll put $1,000 in your Venmo account and then another 5,000 when you do a one hour tell all interview. What do you have to lose? He has not responded to me. Maybe we should send him like a group communication. I mean, I'm going to tell him to listen to the podcast. Thomas Davis, Adam, invite him. Come on. Thomas Davis, wherever you are, whoever you are, we need you to listen to this podcast. And by the way, as you're listening, if you could go to <laughs> Apple and give us five stars, that would be great too. <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> oh, saw that happen. Welcome to What the Hack, a show about hackers, scammers, and the people they go after. I'm Adam Levin, cyber rabbi. I'm Bo, cyber baptizer of strangers in a madcap way until I get my head cut off. And I'm Travis, cyber fist of conchu. <laughs> <laughs> and today we're talking with a former privacy officer at Microsoft and the current global head, get that, global head, of security at Avast. Please welcome Jeff Williams. If you're looking for another podcast to listen to, check out Cautionary Tales. Uh, Adam, can you knock it off with that movie phone voice? Wait, there are other podcasts? <laughs> On the Cautionary Tales podcast, Best-selling author Tim Hartford finds the morals in moments from the greatest mistakes, tragic catastrophes, and hilarious fiascos of the past. You'll have a front row seat as an award-winning choreographer and a rock legend come dangerously close to opening the worst Broadway music of all time. Notice the tiny change in a hotel's blueprint that resulted in tons of concrete, steel, and glass crashing down on the guests and swelter as a deadly heat wave descends on Chicago, killing some residents but oddly sparing their near neighbors. Some stories will delight you, others may scare you, but they'll all make you wiser. Listen to Cautionary Tales wherever you get your podcasts. Hi folks, if you like our show, you should check out Business Casual for Morning Brew. Business Casual dives into the unexpected business story behind everything. How do workers benefit from the great resignation? Will TikTok change the music industry forever? How can I get a used car in this insane market? Journalist Nora Ali and comedian Scott Rogowski bring you conversations with creators, thinkers, and innovators who can tell you what it all means and why you should care. Listen to Business Casual for Morning Brew wherever you get your podcasts. Jeff Williams, 
Bo, it's been 100 years. How are you doing? It has been 130 years. 130. 131 years. Actually, that was when Bo didn't have a beard. <laughs> no, Jeff knew me when I had one sideburn and I worked in the snack shop. Indeed. Yeah. I thought that was during your past days, Bo. No, that was just a one sideburn thing to be um, disturbing. And, I, and I, I, I worked the cash register at the snack bar. Well, the good news is... You don't need just one sideburn to be disturbing anymore. No, I just have to be. <laughs> That's very was this nice in commons you, or... Yeah, it was in commons. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And now you've got me thinking about those cheeseburgers in the snack bar, which there, there has never been more pleasure condensed into $3.50 anywhere since. I, I agree. Those cheeseburgers were magic. So, Jeff... Adam doesn't believe we went to school together, and now he thinks that I studied acting. Uh, you were a lit major, right? I was a lit major. And, and you, were, always, you were... He was always lit when you guys were in college? I was always Majorly lit. But, <laughs> <laughs> I was always lit. But Jeff, you were, you were a drama major, correct? Yeah, I, technical theater. So I started, I started in drama and then realized as I was in classes with Pete Dinklage and Justin Thoreau that I didn't want to eat ramen for the rest of my life. And if that was going <laughs> to be my competition, I'd probably end up that way. So. Yeah, true story. We did we did have both Pete Tinklage and Justin Theroux were there at the same time. Yeah, they're both very cool. Well, yeah. it was good to go see the plays. The plays were quite good. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeff, how did you get from VAPA at Bennington College to become the head of c cybersecurity? Is, is, I don't know if that's your title, but the head of security at Avast. Not just not just head. Global head. I, I am the global head. I my, my well, you know, having gone to Bennington, my my head was big to begin with. So going <laughs> going global with that was just a natural progression. Uh, no, but seriously, <laughs> uh, as, as I you know, as I as I think about the the history, it's really been a series of being in the right place at the right time and being smart. Um, so I kind of fell into going into technology you know, because I didn't want to eat the ramen. Um, I had in, I had intended to be part of the film industry, but I wasn't related to anybody. So uh, there was uh, you know a, a serious downside in trying to get jobs for pay that people were willing to take for free to get a credit. So I ended up moving into computers, which I'd always had a natural aptitude for. I'd been doing since I was six or seven, um, and uh, it turned out they wanted to pay people to do that. I thought that was pretty keen. So did you actually go to? Hollywood and and try your hand at, at getting into the movies. I did Hollywood and San Francisco. And then you started studying computers out there. No, I didn't study. It's something I just always done. So uh, oh oh. So since we're on the subject of Hollywood, what's your favorite movie? Oh, you did that's, not. <laughs> I, I did. that's like asking a parent who their favorite child is. I, how how do you pick one? All right, top five. My top five children. Uh, no. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done, Jeff. I love you more. <laughs> I think at least three of my top five favorite movies are Blade Runner and the different versions that have come out. Wow. All right. right. That's an answer. That is an Excellent answer. taste. Ridley Scott would uh, be proud. How about your favorite uh, hacking movie? Oh. Do you have one? You know, we, we end up talking about this at work periodically as we try to come up with backdrops for, for all hands meetings and things like that when we want a theme. Uh, so I, I've gone through all of them. I, you know, the, the obvious answer would be to say hackers, um, which just because sure. it's so much fun. But uh, I think I'm going to go with Spy Game. Oh, nice. Spy Game. Good one. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Caraway Home. It's time to ditch the chemicals with Caraway Home's non-toxic cookware and bakeware collection so you can make healthier cooking a piece of cake. Caraway Home's non-toxic kitchenwares are all designed for the modern home and feature a chemical-free ceramic coating so food can be prepared with peace of mind that no hard-to-pronounce compound will leach into your healthy ingredients. I got the cookware set in a beautiful cream color. It's a modern and chemical-free iteration of the traditional 16B set boiled down to four essentials, a fry pan, a saute pan, a saucepan and a Dutch oven. And my wife loved it. And our first meal was shrimp curry and it was fantastic. 
fantastic. Like if you actually, if you doubt this, I will tell you that last night I received a picture of this cookware via text. And I can assure you that it had shrimp in it and it was cream colored, but um, do they have to get cream colored or is there other things they can get? No, 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 there, there are other colors. There are other colors. Cream just happened to blend in our house, but no, it was oh, fabulous. Blend. Nice, I see what you did there. One of the things we liked about it the best is it, it has this wonderful slick surface. So you don't have to use much oil or butter to make a really, really great meal. Visit carawayhome.com backslash WTH to take advantage of this limited time offer for 10% off your next purchase. This deal is exclusive for our listeners. So visit carawayhome.com backslash WTH or use code WTH at checkout. Caraway, non-toxic cookware made modern. Travis, have you ever searched for anything online you wouldn't want anyone to know about? No, never, actually. Really? Really. Bo, how about you? Yeah, totally. I mean, like a thousand percent, yes. And, you know, not always something super embarrassing. <laughs> if you're listening to the show and, you, you know, you're like, well, I listen to What the Hack and I know how to stay safe. I'm just going to use incognito mode. Incognito mode doesn't hide your activity. And it doesn't matter what mode you use or how many times you clear your browsing history. Your internet service provider can still see every single website you've ever visited. Yeah. And that's why I never go online without using ExpressVPN. It really doesn't matter who your internet service provider is. ISPs in the U.S. can legally sell your information to ad companies. ExpressVPN is an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your ISP can't see the sites that you visit. ExpressVPN also keeps all of your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. ExpressVPN is available on all your devices, phones, computers, even your smart TV. So there's no excuse for you to not be using it. Well, protect your online activity today with the VPN rated number one by Business Insider. Visit our exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash WTH, and you can get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S VPN dot com slash wth express vpn dot com slash wth and you get three months free on us so jeff after you were in college with Bo, but before you were head of security at avas you worked for microsoft in the early 2000s right absolutely not too long thereafter is when we started to see viruses and worms just hitting everybody. So you think about Sasser, Slammer, Blaster, you know, you, they, you can't, you, you couldn't turn your head uh, at that point and not see 10 or 20 or 30,000 computers getting hit by some new worm. It was always in the press. It was always something you'd read about. Uh, and it was hard to stop because the, the software at the time, security wasn't on by default. I and mean, we've come a long, long way in the last 20 years. Uh, but at the time, it was kind of a free-for-all with the, the miscreants, you know, people who were trying to make a name for themselves. It, you know, it hadn't even really gotten to the point of monetization. Uh, but then everything started to change, and we saw this acceleration. So at Microsoft, I ended up in a variety of security and privacy roles, security architect, later divisional privacy officer, and then ultimately... Uh, a senior member of the Malware Protection Center. Were you ever um, a part of the Microsoft Digital Crimes Unit? I worked in parallel with the Digital Crimes Unit. So I was the liaison between the Malware Protection Center and the Digital Crimes Unit. And the, the work that I and members of my team were doing was to uh, select the targets for uh, takedown and to provide support on you know, analyzing the malware itself and, and providing information so that the, the digital crimes unit could do their work. Uh, and they did excellent work. They had technologists as well as lawyers, which is a really good combination for that kind of work. Right. Uh, I, I think I, I just want to uh, roll it back a little bit uh, for our uh, listeners. Uh, when you refer to worms, I know that they're not quite as uh, popular, as big of a cyber threat right now. Uh, what exactly was a worm or is a worm? Yeah, so a worm is a piece of malicious code that can infect a computer. And once that computer is infected, use that computer as a launching point to infect other computers. Now, so, is this like Stuxnet, Jeff? Uh, Stuxnet, uh, I believe, is in fact a worm. 
Okay. And so what, what do they, they, they are, are, how are they different from a botnet? So, so, so a botnet is a collection of machines which have been infected. And usually there's a command and control infrastructure where the, the bot herder, the person who owns the botnet, can send commands to all the infected machines to do a thing. So now they're that, like a, the robot army, right? It's Yeah, it's very much like a robot army. And, and the things that they can do are, you know, whatever the attacker has coded them to do. So they mm. can send spam, they can do denial of service, they can install new software, new malicious software, uh, any, anything that you can code up. And, and you know, o- over time, we've seen a real evolution in the capability of these botnets. First, you know, from single purpose doing something stupid like denial of service, all the way up to something that's, you know, criminal in nature and monetary in function, uh, whether that be ransomware or uh, spam for profit or phishing or any number of things. And some even do a combination of this. And the ones that do a combination of this ended up being turned into crime as a service in many cases, where the, the, the bot herder would sell access to their botnet because they could do all these things. And so other criminals who might not have the capability to build their own botnet could join in the fun and do their bad things using the same botnet. And now to be clear, some of the crimes we're talking about were like the ubiquitous, oh, there's that big word, uh, uh, emails that we saw advertising drugs. And as we know, those drugs weren't always real and they could be very dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. They, there was a lot of uh, counterfeit pharma being sold uh, through spam. Uh, you saw marketplaces getting stood up, you know, the Canadian pharmacies selling V1 Agra uh, and similar things to that's why it doesn't work. Oh, poor Adam. <laughs> no, you, you should have, you never buy off brand Viagra. <laughs> poor guy. Um, All I can say is my, my uh, C1 Alice seems to be working perfectly, but. Uh, oh, wah, wah. Yeah. Um, what, but besides selling drugs, what else, like what kind of crime? I know I've heard of ransomware as a service, but crime as a service predated it, I'm guessing. It did. It did. And it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just Viagra and Cialis. It was any luxury goods. So, you know, any brand that you would recognize, whether that be Varnay or Rolex or, or whatever. Um, and, and it could be real. It could be fake. You know, some of the things that were being sold online were real. So the, the criminals would go out and steal credit cards and they use those credit cards to make purchases. And then they'd have all this merchandise that they didn't really want. And so the, the so the secondary portion of the attack was to, to fence the, the bad the good. So you get you could get a ten thousand dollar Rolex for a thousand bucks or five hundred bucks. A I, real I, real thing. I, I, I'm just going to say conceptually because I never did any test purchases. No, I, you know <laughs> we we did a recent episode with with uh, with um, uh, Brian Ebert who was the uh, chief of staff for the Secret Service and he walked us through exactly that sort of scam I'm, I'm pretty sure that they did test purchases that, that would be good evidence in work yep yep <laughs> What is the biggest current marketplace right now for cybercrime? Oh, the, the biggest current marketplace, I mean, that changes all the time. And, and one of the good reasons that it changes all the time is that Europol and the FBI and the, uh, the Australian Federal Police have gotten really good at taking them down. Uh, so, you know, if, you, if we think back to when I was getting into this, law enforcement wasn't super excellent at taking down these sites. They didn't always have people on staff who had these technical skills. And so one of the early things, even before the digital crimes unit at Microsoft stood, was stood up, uh, there was a need for companies like Microsoft and, and some of the other majors to go out and help law enforcement learn these skills. And so that that, that was when I first got into this, around the time of Zotob, uh, which was a worm that happened in, I think, 2005. Um, and uh, that was one of the first things that I was involved in in the, the takedown space. And, and that one I wasn't really very much involved in. I, I was aware of it, uh, provided some information to the, some of the people who were doing the active work. It sounds like in the very beginning, like back in 2005, when you were, when you were getting into this world, the, poli- how, the police really had no way of making arrests in, in these, or takedowns or anything like that because they had no idea even uh, that these things existed. Am I right? Yeah, they, not only was there 
you know, not a not a high level of skill in in some of the law enforcement agencies, but there also weren't laws on the book that specifically applied to things on the internet. You know, where where exactly does a crime take place on the internet? Is it on the attacking computer, which might be in country A, or is it on the the victim computer, which is in country B, or is it on the ISP that's in between them, or the five ISPs in five different countries that are in between them? So, so jurisdiction really becomes challenging. Um, the interesting thing with Zotob, and and I'm really impressed with the work that was done there, is because they got arrests and prosecutions against the people responsible, which I think is you know one of the best outcomes you can have in one of these cases. Uh, they actually used money laundering and and other laws that were already on the books that weren't specific to the internet. Uh, and so the the authors who were uh, one was an 18-year-old in Morocco, and the other was a 21-year-old who was in Turkey. Uh, were actually prosecuted in their local jurisdictions using using these kinds of traditional laws. Since we're talking about favorites today, you got a favorite story from your work in security you want to share? I, I think the the best one to, to talk about today would be the, the Rustock takedown, which happened in 2011. So this is after the Digital Crimes Unit had stood up and they'd done a couple of takedowns already with uh, Kelios A uh, and Walladak and, and uh, had some great partnerships that they built with law enforcement and with the ISPs and the, the computer emergency response teams uh, for countries around the world. Uh, because when, when you do a takedown, it's not just enough to dismantle the infrastructure. You've got all of these computers that are still infected. And if another criminal came along and said, oh, there's a flaw in how you took that down, I'm going to go take over that button, all those computers would be back up doing their crimes again. And so uh, cleaning up the computers becomes really important. And so as I was part of the Malware Protection Center at Microsoft, and one of the things my team was responsible for was the malicious software removal tool, uh, the, the natural thing was for us to work with the ISPs and work with the certs around the world to give them custom tooling so that they could do that, so they could do the cleanup after the botnet takedown happened. So the Rustock takedown in 2011, uh, the Rustock botnet was about, somewhere between 1.5 and 2 million infected PCs. So really, really huge compared to what had come before, which you would have measured in the tens of thousands. So this was the biggest to date? Uh, I don't know if it was the biggest to date because Conficker was around the same time and Conficker was also quite large, but it was a, 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 a new scale and, and it represented the, the kind of criminal monetization efforts, you know, when you've got a, a monetary incentive to do this, you might work a little harder and go a little further and bring in additional resources because you know there's going to be a payoff. Um, so so Rustock was one of these Swiss army knife, crime as a service kind of botnets. Uh, and it was pushing out just ridiculous amounts of spam. Uh, and so my role in the, the Malware Protection Center, in addition to, uh, to, to doing the malicious software removal tool, also did um, anti-spam research. So uh, I went to the research team, Terry Zink uh, in particular, um, and, and Terry looked at the, the data to see, you know, where was the most prevalent, which botnets were, were most responsible for the global spam problem? Not just in terms of the volume of spam, but the difficulty in removing the malware associated with it, the persistence, the longevity of the botnet. And so we looked at it from a lot of different uh, angles. I think most people view that as being irritating, but how is that a cybersecurity threat? Well, a lot of spam has links in it, and it's mm -hmm. the links which are sometimes malicious or lead right. to an action that a person might take that's against their interest. So buying something counterfeit mm -hmm. or giving away information or giving access to their own computer inadvertently. So why is it interesting to Microsoft to stop them, Jeff? So, so Microsoft's interest was really to protect the Windows ecosystem and to protect Windows customers because it, it had become such a pervasive problem that it was mm -hmm. impacting the brand, that, that people were equating poor security with Microsoft. So Microsoft had done the, the big stand-up of trustworthy computing saying, you know, we're going to change all of this and we're investing and they 
took all the developers of Windows and made them stop developing code until they learned security, and then they could go back and develop their code securely. Uh, so a lot of things, you know, just fundamentally changed overnight with that that memo in 2003 that Bill mm. Gates sent around. Well, didn't Bill Gates claim that he was going to eradicate spam forever? Yes. Yes. How'd that work out? So, so an unfortunate statement with great intent behind it, and, and you know the. The idea was that spam is a technology problem. Technology problems have solutions. Smart people can come up with good solutions to technology problems. But what the what the the thinking didn't include is that it's not a technology problem, it's an adversary problem. And the adversaries will iterate on their attacks anytime their attacks stop working or anytime they can make their attacks better. And so the, the idea behind Bill Gates' statement about eradicating spam was to use this, uh, this old concept called penny black. Uh, so if you think about the, the original postal system, uh, the early days of the postal system, uh, you could put a penny black stamp on a letter and the person receiving the letter would have to pay the tax. So this was a technology version of penny black where there would be a computational challenge that the receiving computer has to, or the sending computer has to do in order to send the mail. And that computational challenge for one mail, not very impactful, just like a penny isn't very impactful to, to send a letter. But if you're sending a million pieces of spam, if you're sending a million pieces of spam, then that's a, that's a million computations that have to be done. And that's intensive on the computer. You need a bigger computer or more computers in order to do it. All right, so the, the first question is, how successful were these spam bot attacks? Uh, hugely successful. I think at, at one point, uh, spam accounted for 91% of all internet traffic. Wow. So, all right, so in this case, you pretty much could say the technology doesn't always or even often solve cybersecurity problems. I, you know, I think that that's kind of a, a miscasting of, of the technology. So technology isn't, solving problems it's it's the application of technology that solves a problem yeah no but i think i i think i would have said it the same way i i get i get the difference but we're the way that you put it is absolutely brilliant that there's an adversary problem yes yeah i mean when you, when you think about it the the difference between use and abuse is only two letters so there, there's not a there's not a, a big gap between using technology for good and using technology maliciously. It, 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 it's dual use. When you take down something like a, a huge uh, botnet like this, what's the overall impact? Well, in the case of Rustock, the impact was actually pretty huge. And, and mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, it, you know, it was the most impactful spam bot at the time. And when the takedown happened, global spam was reduced by 75% overnight. Wow. And that lasted for a number of months until the, the bad guys came back with new botnets and or the the people who were buying crime as a service bought crime as a service from other botnets and started over with, with some other overnight 75 percent drop o overnight a 75 percent drop in spam so, so bill gates has promised came true and he <laughs> loved you <How's> uh, <laughs> we we tried I, I don't know if bill gates even knows my name but that's okay <laughs> what do you think uh, law enforcement learned from that and then also what do you think uh other uh, cyber criminals learn from that uh, takedown? Well, so, so the, the legal side of this, I think the biggest thing that came out of Rustock is that Richard Boscovich, who was heading up the Digital Crimes Unit, still is heading up the Digital Crimes Unit, uh, he came up with what I think is a pretty novel legal approach. Because the spam was targeting brands like Viagra and, and Rolex and, and whatever, uh, he treated it as a trademark problem. Hmm. And so worked with the with the court under the Lanham Act to allow the seizure seizure of those servers as, as part of a trademark infringement claim. Uh, really kind of interesting approach to, to going after the, the criminals directly. So that's like a very unique setup um, that Microsoft had where they had put together technologists and law lawyers to figure out strategies to actually stop these people. And trademark was was the sort of the 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 workaround that they found. Absolutely. The, the combination of a legal and technical approach is so much better than just going after from a technical perspective. You know, we, and, and the team could have pushed out malicious software removal tool, you know, until this, until the, the cows came home and there'd still be new malware infecting machines and, and so on. So it, it's playing whack-a-mole. 
Uh, but when you when you get the the legal side of it right, uh, then you know you're not only taking the infrastructure, but you create the chilling effect. In some cases, you might actually go after the individual. So a lot of these cases are filed as John Doe cases. You don't know who's responsible, but you know there's a responsible party. Uh, and so when the cases are filed, it's against John Doe. And then as you collect more information, like you might get from the forensics of examining servers taken from a co-location facility, which the attackers had connected to from their home machine, uh, then all of a sudden that Joe, John Doe can turn into an actual person uh, and that person can be charged with crimes. And if you get an arrest, like I said, that's the best possible outcome. Did, uh, did brands get involved in the prosecution? I, I believe that there were brands involved. I think that Pfizer uh, wrote uh, an am uh, amicus brief uh, in support of the case. I think there was another brand, but I don't know if they've gone public about uh, who it was. I don't know if it's a public record. Uh, but there were definitely luxury brands being harmed. And so the, the court looked at this as not just a technology problem, but a business problem. And because of this, you, people were able to seize the infrastructure and use th these seizures in order to do more forensic analysis, right? That's right. That's right. And uh, uh, that that forensic analysis of servers can lead to things like if the you know if the the criminal is really good about masking the machines that they've infected it never connects to them because they have a command and control infrastructure. If they connect to the command and control infrastructure from their own machine without obfuscation of any kind, that leaves you know these digital breadcrumbs that can then be followed in a traditional law enforcement uh, kind of way uh, from from an investigation perspective. So if I see that IP address 1.2.3.4 connected at 10.17 p.m. to the server that I know was involved in the command and control, uh, then I can go to the ISP and say, at that time, who had that IP address? So, yeah, I, I think one of the main things I'm kind of wondering about here is if you can walk us through what the uh, forensic steps were to be able to uh, both identify and then uh, to be able to take down this uh, operation. Sure. And uh, Bo and Adam, please let them speak. <laughs> will do, will do. So, <laughs> so the, the case to the, the, the case preparation took took several months, and it, it was not just the legal side of things, getting the 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 story that the court had to be told in order to get the outcome that was desired to to seize the servers and so on. But there was a technical aspect. We had to enumerate the entire botnet. Where was it in the world? What IP addresses, how many, what countries, and, and so on. Uh, with that information, we were able to go to the to the cert for each of the countries and the ISPs that were hosting the infected IP addresses that we could see and say, you have a problem, we want to help you solve that problem, and can we have a, a conversation? And so th this partnership kind of happens in silence. It's something where, you know, it's part of the investigation, so you keep it close to your chest. Operational security is tight. You don't even talk about it within your own companies so that you know only the people who are working on it who have that need to know are involved. Uh, when you get all of those pieces in place, then it can go to the court. And so the, the lawyers took it to, I believe it was a court in North Carolina, uh, and went to the court and said, you know, we'd like a temporary restraining order uh, that says we're able to go and seek the people responsible. And that was done under seal so that the court records didn't spoil the idea that we were going to do this takedown. Uh, the bad guys didn't, of course, appear in court to respond to the, the temporary restraining order because they're a criminal. Why would they? Uh, right. You know, why are you going to show up and say, yeah, I did that. Leave me alone uh, <laughs> because they're going to get walked out in bracelets. Uh, but the, uh, the court saw that this was a business problem. This was a technical problem that, yes, crimes were being committed. That nobody had stood up to say, "Hey, don't do that. You've got the story wrong, and I'm, you know, I'm innocent." Uh, and so the court granted the request to take over the servers. And so the U.S. Marshal Service was called out. I think they went to five or six co-location facilities in the United States. Um, I think there were 96 total servers involved in this globally. I'm not sure of the 96 how many were in the U.S., but it was uh, five or six locations that, that they went into hosters and said. That server right there, I'm going to take it with me. Um, and the hard drives from those were then pulled, contents of them examined, and so on. And while that forensic examination was happening, the, the remediation phase went into effect. So because Microsoft had taken over the botnet, all of the machines that were infected and calling home were now calling home to Microsoft's server. 
So, so the IP addresses that had been used for command and control were now Microsoft IP addresses. So all that traffic was going to, to the digital crimes unit. And the digital crimes unit was cataloging it by IP address and timestamp and going back to the ISPs and saying, here are the machines that need to be fixed. So are the uh, compromised device, uh, devices here, were those uh, computers, routers, IoT devices? or Yeah, for Rustock, it was computers. The, the net effect of it. So in the first seven days uh, after, after controlling those IP addresses, uh, 1.7 million unique IP addresses checked in to the botnet. So there wow. may have been more at the time, computers that just weren't turned on or weren't connected to a network, uh, but th- th- yet were still infected. Uh, but 1.7 million in the, the first seven days. And I think the, the, the max number we saw was 2.4 million. So huge, huge botnet. Um, and that, that partnership uh, with the ISPs and certs. And, and also, I should probably mention uh, FireEye. FireEye, Alex Landstein uh, of FireEye was a, a malware analyst researcher uh, who contributed to the, to the work that, that was done along with people at Microsoft. I think one of the things I'd like to uh, just be able to break down for our listeners here is uh, a lot of the time when we hear about things like um, malware or uh, botnets and the like, it kind of so- it, it sounds like it's this huge abstract uh, concept. Um, in the case of the Rustock, uh, how were those computers uh, compromised? You know, I don't actually have that answer. Uh, there, there were there there were so many infections happening at the time that to say you know one infection vector versus another infection vector. Uh, you know, it could have been people clicking on things that they shouldn't have, whether it be on a website or in a spam email that they got uh, from an earlier iteration of the botnet or from a different botnet. Uh, it could be people downloading software that isn't the real thing and so it comes with malicious content included. Uh, things they find in Usenet groups where they're downloading things to, you know, have cracks uh, or, you know, pirated software, uh, you know, in any number of ways people can get infected. Yeah, that that totally makes sense. I just I, I think uh, one of the whole things about uh, cybercrime is uh, people tend to think like that's just something that happens, and then uh, uh, they don't really know that their own uh, personal device can actually be uh, compromised and then leveraged uh, into a, a spam attack, for instance. Yeah, well, well it, and and it is just something that happens, but it's something mm-hmm. that doesn't have to happen because right. if you think today about the guidance we're giving people about you know here are the five things that you could do to improve your security, you know, use strong passwords and don't use the same password on multiple sites and uh, use multi-factor authentication and keep your software up to date and keep your operating system up to date. You know, it, it, those things are the same things that we were saying in 2001, 2002, 2003. You know, it, it's been the same guidance all along. The, the challenge is that software manufacturers haven't made it easy for people to do the best thing for security. Uh, it's gotten better. It's certainly gotten better every time, but uh, it's it's not easy yet. You know, the, the very fact that you need to remember a password to get into a site, but there's a hundred sites that you need to get into, uh, is, is something that just creates all kinds of problems. Are you going to use the same password at Amazon that you use at, you know, Joe's pirated software emporium? You know, or are you going to use? You can say the pirate bay. That's fine. <laughs> the pirate bay. Arr! <laughs> Uh, yeah, you're right. That, that was a big one. But, uh, you know, the the idea that you're not in full control of that password once you have it logged on somebody else's site is a real problem of identity. You know, it, the, if, if they store it, if they store your personal information, then all of a sudden they're the custodian of it. And if they don't adequately protect it, it ends up in some breach that ends up getting sold in those same dark markets. You know, I think, you know, it, if you go to haveibeenpwned.com, you'll see that there are literally hundreds of millions of email password combinations that are available for sale in the underground. We, we are the evangelists for Have I Been Pwned. But uh, do you ask them? Some... Ask them, Adam. I'm, ask them the password. Ask, ask them the password question, man. I'm dying to ask you the <laughs> password question. Oh, my God. So this big drive by Microsoft and Google and Apple to get people to do it another way. Yep. Uh, how do you feel about that one? Uh, so I'm absolutely in favor of it. I think the passwordless is a very powerful way to get away from uh, a fundamental technology challenge. You know, my- Jeff, 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 yes. did you see the Big Lebowski? Dude, hold my drink. 
Dude. <laughs> well, you remember the nihilists? And they said, you know, they, she she cut her pinky off. Um, you remember them? Like, what well, people are going to start cutting people's thumbs off. I disagree. I don't see the thumb cutting. <laughs> Jeff, is, Jeff, is a, Jeff is stunned by the level of stupidity maybe, I just threw at him. Maybe it was a pinky out. toe, for the record. I, it was uh, actually popular singer eyeball, Amy Mann's uh, toe. So, uh, I, I, Amy, I, I think your scoring of actual risks uh, doesn't put that one at the top of the list. You know, if Whatever. You, if you've got a situation where a criminal has the ability to cut off your finger, they can compel you to enter your password in lots of other ways. Not if they're not Jack Bauer. Stare at this <laughs> cell phone. Okay, okay, okay. We let him answer. Now I'll stop interrupting. <laughs> Why do you think it's a good thing and how will they do it? Is it biometrics? Is it a token? What is it? I, it, well, I think there's multiple ways to do it, biometrics token, but I think the, the really important aspect of it is, is getting to that idea of self-sovereignty, that, that I control my identity. I don't have to have my identity on 100 different sites. I don't have to have my personal information on 100 different sites. I control it. I control where it goes. You know, right now, if I order something on Amazon, they have my password, they have my address, they have my credit card number, they have my order history and all the things that go along with it. And then in fulfilling that order, they give my address name and, and other information to UPS so that they can deliver. They give information to Visa so they can process the transaction. And so there's all of this information that's going to multiple parties. And that's even before we start to get to the ad tracking and, and the cookies and, and things where, where my preferences and, and actions are being profiled. But, but if I've got all of this controlled on my own device in a tightly encrypted manner, um, and I choose where it goes, then, then I don't have to worry about that onward transfer. You know, UPS doesn't need to know of anything other than my address to deliver me a package. They need to know that it's authorized, that, that it should be going to my address, uh, but they don't need to know my name even. They, they don't need to know what's in the box. They don't need to know anything like that. Visa doesn't need to know anything except I need money. I need money from Jeff, and and here's the amount, and it's approved. And Amazon. I kind of love to, this. You're make you're selling it, man. You're and Amazon, it. you know, Amazon doesn't need to know my credit card. They only need to know that Visa says, yeah, he's good for it. Go ahead. So, so this idea of not having all of this sensitive and personal information stored in a hundred different places in order to do the things that we do every single day reduces the risk overall. So I think there's a, a real power in putting things into the control of the individual, as long as the software providers make it easy for the individual to do the right thing. Jeff Williams, you just knocked it out of the park. I am no, I am, I now belong to the church of your way of looking at this. No, we have always said that there's a shared responsibility and the individual plays an critical role in cybersecurity and in cyber hygiene. So we're we're all it's just the this is the same choir. Yeah, we're all singing together. Yeah, here. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's some. I think it's something that uh, people tend to overlook, where they look at um, the Venn diagram between privacy and security as being uh, not a lot of overlap. But at the same time, yeah, I, I think you're uh, completely spot on here. Where um, your privacy is a matter of security because the fact that when you know who has access to your information, that uh, <laughs> lets you know who is uh, able to uh, access your accounts. Yeah, but, but, but let me ask you one question. And that is, what if you lose your device in this tightly controlled internet secure world? Well, you can't lose the cloud. So, so if you've got your encrypted content stored in the cloud and available to all your devices and authenticated with biometrics or something else that, that's provable uh, as you, then then that problem is solved. So something you know, something you have, and something you are. Yeah, but, 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 but Jeff isn't storing something on the cloud, just storing something on someone else's computer? The cloud is definitely someone else's computer. So isn't that a problem? Depends on the other person. Uh. That's like the adversary problem, so but the reverse. The other guy. The other guy. <laughs> well, look, the bad guys are always looking for ways to get after you, and they're going to get you. Yeah. And anything we can do to make it harder for them is going to help us. Absolutely. Right? I mean, that's the bottom line. Absolutely. I, I want to go back to something that Travis said, though. Uh, he talked about the Venn diagram of security and privacy. And right. I, I don't actually view it as a Venn diagram, because I, I think they're too intertwined to, to be separated. I think that... Mm. Security is the how, privacy is the why. 
That is an excellent way of putting that. I you like are like that. I want Jeff to be the president of all things cybersecurity everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff makes us look like a smart for having gone to Bennington. So. Or he makes us look smart for just having known him. Um, no, so I, <laughs> so, oh, so the, but, the but I have a question. Boys club here, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so see, as Adam was saying, you know, we're all singing with the same choir. Jeff, did you sing with Randy's choir at Bennington? I, I didn't sing with the choir, but I, I did take the wish and, uh, and I did do some performances and so. Okay. Cause I thought maybe that we sang next to each other. I was the worst world's worst tenor, but I guess not. Well, uh, maybe you guys could, you know, sing a cybersecurity song together. Would you have a cybersecurity song? How does it go? <laughs> sing a song. No, no, no. Doesn't stop. Have to be long. Please stop. Don't Just try not to be wrong. <laughs> As we wrap this up, and we are eternally grateful for you sharing a few moments of your life with us, although apparently you shared part of your life with <laughs> some of us before the rest of us. Uh, what, what, what tips would you throw out there for people since we are the ultimate guardians for ourselves, our families, our companies? We are ultimately. So what tips would you do? Well, I would say that, that just be cognizant of what you're doing online and the providers who you're trusting with your data, what are they doing? If you think about things like, well, really uh, uh, any social media site is not really serving you, they're serving advertisers and they're, they're serving other data aggregators and, and they're profiting on your information. While it's not a bad thing necessarily because they provide a free service to you in the process, free in quotation marks, uh, you're, you're paying with your data and information about your activities. Uh, you know, just be aware of what you're doing and know that other people are going to see that people beyond just your friends. And, and you know, the the whole idea of surveillance capital, the the underpinning is that for person A to communicate with person B, person C has to make a profit from the conversation. And and so, uh, you know, it's 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 a situation where we've really backed ourselves into a corner with the internet itself. Uh, by building everything on this. And I think that the way we take that back is by putting control into people's hands, uh, you know, passwordless and self-sovereign identity and uh, some of the other things that are, are starting to come to more prominence, uh, the, the Web3 uh, kinds of ideas, I think uh, are very, very powerful. And I, I hope that it democratizes uh, information again, instead of putting it in the hands of a few very powerful entities. All right. Thank you, Jeff, so much. Thanks a lot, Jeff. It was a pleasure to be here. Right. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks. So Jeff said that after the Microsoft team took down the Rostock botnet, in just a few months, the bad guys moved on, spam levels rose again. Hmm. And he, he said the same tips that he was giving people back then are still tips he gives out today. Are we just doomed? Yes. Is this mm -hmm. type of attack unavoidable? No, I mean, that was the whole thing that was so um, amazing about uh, Jeff was he is the first person I've heard talk for any extended period of time on the topic of cybersecurity and privacy who made me feel like there might be hope. So we don't have to move to the country like you and hang out with bears and tractors. Oh, uh, you know, I just fixed my tractor, which I ran over a rock and it got, anyway, you don't want to hear. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, we don't, no, we don't. I think we can just, you know, the thing that I was allergic to, the password free situation, sounds like, it sounds really promising. It does, especially when you consider the uh, parties involved there. That's Apple, Google, There's going to be parties? Microsoft. Yeah. Well, yeah. There like, will what, be like a, a rave or like a... There'll be a celebration <laughs> of privacy. Oh, so oh, that kind of party, like oh, yeah, because I mean, it is interesting that those are the biggest players. We know that Apple, Microsoft, and Google are—that's the list so far, at least the headliners. Is there anyone else, big time, that should be on that list? That at least, as far as we know, isn't on the list. Yet? All right, a hundred percent. I have one. Uh, you only get one each. Or Travis, you can go. Who's yours? I'd say uh, any major um, internet provider in China. That's rather specific. Well, I, that that is right now. I mean, they have a huge population. That's a really big market. But when we talk about Apple, Google, Microsoft, 
those are US based companies and the internet is a global uh, phenomenon. It's a it's a global environment. This has been an episode of me understanding in a very humble way that I'm dumb. Uh, the, <laughs> the, Finally. <laughs> well, you know, it had to happen. But the um, because mine was very different from that. I think that on that list should be, you know, Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, as when he takes possession of Twitter, and all of the other major portals that are, let's face it, social media is the way people, quote unquote, go online, a lot of people. And I, I certainly think that any organization that is dealing with children and children's information absolutely needs to, to do that as well. Yeah, and it's not just, t I mean, TikTok obviously was in my grouping of social media, but um, yeah, I mean, but the internet touches, you know, everyone's lives and, and, and it's sort of indiscriminate. I think that's kind of the point is it would be nice if we could fine tune the way that individuals experience it. Well, and, and think about the fact that for many people in the world, Facebook is the internet for them. There is nothing else. Well, I think one thing that uh, we often overlook too, though, is that Facebook uh, for, or Meta in general and yeah, Google yeah. and Apple and Microsoft all have such a huge reach that if they can actually commit to doing one change, then that will actually have a, a global impact. I think Jeff should be in charge of the whole thing. I'm with you on that. Make it so. Make it so, number one. <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i'm i'm bowled over i think it's i think i think that um this episode was the i i have to say if we did it we did the favorites in the beginning which i thought was a little tedious but no offense everyone else who's been on this show this is at this moment at this very moment sally field style who really really i really really liked this episode Right now, I really like this episode. I learned so much. Are we saying... Do you hear that, Dana Dute? Do you hear that with your anchovies? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that was cold, man. I meant right now. You're, you're Dana, fishing for something there, my friend. Wow, Travis, <laughs> you're bad. We've emailed back and forth a few times. We've uh, come to an agreement on uh, Nato, so we're good. <laughs> okay, good. I feel so much better about that yeah. now. I, I can go to sleep at nights. Yep. I'm not. I'm not switching. I'm not going to change horses on this one. But I do really uh, love that Dana Dude episode as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also need to hear from our listeners. In addition to you know when you do your ratings and you write the reviews, tell us whether or not you think the favorites list is tedious. I'm hurt. <laughs> I'm wounded. No, I'm because crushed. what if they think it, if they think it's tedious, you're going to be even more hurt because they're going to be like four stars, four stars because the list that the best of thing was tedious. Okay, so I tell you what, then our our listeners, when they're rating us, you know, mm -hmm. in between the stars, can tell us what their favorite episode is of this show. Fair enough. I think that. Huh? I think mm -hmm. that. Yep. Yeah. I'm I'm down with that. I think that that'll stop them from giving you four stars and making you very sad. I don't want to be sad. I want to be happy. I want to be glad. I want to be happy and glad <laughs> and never again be sad. I never will cry. I never we will have sigh because I want to be glad. He never will cry. He never will sigh because he wants to be glad. And now the world looks bright and What the Hack with Adam Levin is a production of Loud Tree Media. It's produced by Andrew Stephen, the man with two first names. You can find us online at loudtreemedia.com and on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Adam K. Levin. <laughs>